The following program is a UWTV classic. University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marcia Alvar. Bill Bradley's mother wanted him to be a success. His father wanted him to be a gentleman. Neither wanted him to be a politician. But Bradley was always interested in politics, and even when he was playing basketball with the world champion New York Knicks, his teammates called him Mr. President. In 1978, Bradley was elected to the first of three terms in the U.S. Senate. But in 1995, the New Jersey Democrat announced he had made the decision to leave what he called the greatest elective job in the world. In his new memoir, Time Present, Time Past, Bradley shares what American politics looks like and feels like from the inside. Welcome to Upon Reflection. Good to be with you, Marcia. You were sworn into the Senate. You were the youngest sitting member of the Senate at the time, I'm you were no 35 the years old, that's no longer <laughs> the case. How much has the Senate and the job of being in the Senate changed since that day? Um, I think it's changed uh, not a whole lot. I think that politics has changed. I mean, politics is much more mean-spirited. Campaigns are much more expensive. Uh, it's much more of attack politics, but the Senate itself has not changed that much. It's still an institution that really functions on the basis of substance. You have to know what you're talking about, procedure. You got to know the language of the Senate. Uh, and and there's lots of fun stories about right. that in your book. And personality. You got to understand who your fellow senators are in order to get anything done. If you didn't have to run for office, would you stay in the Senate? Is it the running for the office that's gotten so tiresome? No, I mean, I'm leaving the Senate, but I'm not leaving public life. And the reason I'm leaving the Senate, because there are other things that I want to do that I think are in the public interest that you can't do if you are a conscientious, hardworking senator, spending 12 hours a day in committees, subcommittees, caucuses, back and forth to your state, master the complex mastering the complexities of legislation. And there are things that I want to do in the public interest that you can't do if you're doing that work. And what are those things? Well, I'd like to try to energize um, movements in various states around the country to get fundamental campaign finance reform. I mean, I think money is distorting democracy in America today. And I think that uh, you need to be very radical. I mean, I think, you know, money in politics is a little bit like ants in your kitchen. I mean, <laughs> you're either going to get them all out, block all the holes, or they're going to find a way in. I don't think that it's going to happen in Washington in our current context. I think the pressure's got to come from the states. That's one of the things I'd like to do. The other thing, to, oh, go ahead. Well, the other thing I'd like to do is um, I'd like to um, formulate, think through uh, kind of the next chapter of the American story, particularly in terms of where we are in this economic transformation that is just creating great distress in millions of Americans' lives, people great working anxiety. harder, le earning less. I mean, you know, 130 million jobs in America, 90 million of them do repetitive tasks, each, not all, but each, potentially vulnerable to being displaced by information technology. How much is that shaping American politics, the fact that we're going through this enormous change and time of transition? Well, I think it is the one of the fundamental forces at work in our society. And that's aside from money in um, campaigns. That's aside from money in campaigns. It is, uh, you know, we're basically moving, as we did at the end of the 19th century. We moved from agriculture to the industrial society. Had all kinds of ramifications. Had political movements spawned out of that transformation. Agrarian populism right. was very was good. one of them. Uh, progressivism came out of the response to the populace. But uh, I think the other, uh, and I think you could trace Pat Buchanan right back to the populace of the 19th century that were railing against uh, gold bugs and railing against foreigners and the whole thing. I think uh, that where we are now is, you know, we're moving into the information age and people are losing their jobs. I mean, people who worked hard 
um, and who thought they were doing a good job, who got good progress reports, but suddenly they arrive uh, at work one day, not unlike what happens at the Hercules Research Center outside Wilmington, Delaware, where you arrive at work. And the way you know you've lost your job there, you come in on a Monday morning, you go into your building, you go up to your floor, you walk down your hallway, and if there's a Pinkerton standing outside your office door, you know, well, that's the day you're going to be fired. And the Pinkerton says to you, well, now, Marsh, you've done a good job here for 25 years, but, you know, downsizing internationally, blah, 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 you got to get out. And by the way, could you be cleared out of your desk by noon? And not that I expect you're going to sabotage the computer, but I'd like to just stay here. And on Mondays at the Hercules Research Center, nobody carpools because they think they're going to be fired. You're a student of political history, and there's some wonderful... Uh, history in this book, uh, the the McKinley campaign, which the, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, it's quote, very interesting because I sold was, like a patent medicine. Uh, Roosevelt uh, on said. this book tour, we did this thing in St. Louis. I grew up in this small town uh, on the banks of the Mississippi River. Three thousand four hundred ninety-two people. Crystal City, Missouri. Crystal City. Ninety-six in my high school graduating class. One stoplight, and at the book uh, signing in uh, Chris, in St. Louis. The high school teacher who inspired the title of Chapter 8, which is Money is Power, and who was the teacher for whom I wrote the first paper in history on the 1896 election, attended the book signing. Does politics move in cycles from your study of political history, and are there, you, you mentioned the, the echoes of the populist campaigns of the, of the 19th century in, in contemporary cam campaigns, are there other lessons from that? I mean, the country coped with it. We got through it somehow. Well, I think that that is a, a very positive lesson, and that is that our institutions have always been flexible enough, and we have been open enough as a people to find our way out of any difficulty we were in. And in some cases, that uh, took longer. Sometimes it was more painful, but institutions adjusted. For example, at the end of the 19th century, in the midst of all this industrialism, progressives arose. And they had basically four objectives. One was to have universal suffrage, which meant women should have the right to vote. Good idea. Second is direct election of senators. No longer have those state legislatures select them, but have the people select U.S. senators. Third was initiative and referendum. They let go direct democracy on some things. And four was campaign finance reform. Of course, we got everything except the fourth. So I think it's only appropriate that on the eve of the 21st century we complete the progressive agenda that was first formulated in the, in the eve of the 20th century. But yeah, those things, you know, they, they, those things still remain and they come around again. Um, you see that often. Why are so many members of, of both the Senate and the House leaving? There's mm. something like three dozen members of Congress, more than uh, 12 members of the Senate. Is it the same reason that, that you just gave? Um, I think that each person has a different reason. Um, uh, but is there a common thread? Well, the only common thread would, and I don't think this is the precipitating factor, but I think everyone who is leaving would concur, Republican and Democrat, that the politics is much more mean-spirited in terms of campaigns and that the constant money chase is sometimes exhausting for no purpose, really. Um, and I, I think that that's a common thread, but each person had a different reason. I mean, one of the things that most people don't understand about the U.S. Senate and that I try to reveal in the book through stories is how human an institution it is. I and mean, very collegial. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's in the best sense of the word. I mean, it's not a matter of having two people of different parties in each corner of the room shouting at each other. You don't make things happen that way. So the Senate rewards coming together and hammering out some kind of consensus out of which you can get a little progress. And that ultimately depends on people being civil with each other. I mean, I, one of the stories I tell in the book is about Al Simpson, who's a senator from Wyoming. He's much different than I am on most policy issues, but we've kind of crossed those partisan waters with a bridge of empathy, uh, kind of capacity to listen and to shoot straight. And one night I was on um, a, an extended Nightline program. It was during the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas uh, <laughs> brouhaha. And uh, we went at it. I mean, you know, the control room in New York was saying, let it go another half an hour, let it go another half an hour. The thing went hour and a half. And we, Al and I had exchanged some real angry words with each other on national television. So the program is over, finally. And I sit there on the stage and my mind turns to things that I'm supposed to do. And I realize that I'm supposed to pick up a quart of milk for our daughter's breakfast. And I look in my, my pocket and I don't have any money. 
And so the question is, well, who do I trust enough to ask for a couple of bucks to buy some milk for it? Uh, certainly not Ted Koppel, right? So <laughs> I go over to oh, so, so. Al and I say, Al, can you lend me $10? So I go, buy three cents some milk. And he said, sure. He gave me $10. I bought a quart of milk at an all-night grocery store on the way home. And then I bought a box of Wheaties and thought of Al. <laughs> Those are nice, uh, nice moments uh, in the book. Are you saying that those moments are harder to find now? Mm, uh, no, I, I think that they're still there, obviously. Um, I think that that's why the Senate itself hasn't changed. I mean, in the beginning of 1995, for example, you had the Gingrich Revolution, had some Senate overflow, you had some ideological Republicans come into the Senate, and they're beginning to realize they haven't gotten anything done. And the reason they haven't gotten anything done is because the Senate puts a premium on minority rights. So that in order to get any movement, you have to moderate. And so they are slowly being moderated, or one might say broken, uh, by the Senate. And I think that that's the only thing that prevents the Senate from being like the House of Representatives, which is people shouting at each other. Mm. Uh, in the introduction, I mentioned the you called the, the job in the Senate the best elective job in the world, although you hedge it a little bit in the book by saying, well, there are other great jobs in, in, in the world as well. You are talked about as a presidential candidate. The year 2000 is still mm. some time away, and you haven't, see, you haven't said, at least as far as I know, you haven't <laughs> said whether or not you're right. going to be running that year. In the book, it's a moment that takes place in Seattle, and it was a very poignant moment in the way you described it begins a whole section where you talk about the presidency, and it, it began with a glimpse you got of then-candidate Bill Clinton in Seattle. Can you describe that? Uh, yes. <clears throat> uh, the incident is uh, I'm campaigning for him. Our paths cross in Seattle. We're in the Westin Hotel, a place I stayed with when I was with the Knicks, and we played here several times a year. And uh, I'm, uh, he, I, he's coming in. I write him a note, and I say that, you know, you're going to, you're going to, uh, win the election, you got two weeks left to enjoy yourself. I give it to the Secret Service, I go to bed. The next morning I come down and I run into him in the lobby. And uh, he's going out to jog and I'm going to fly to Montana and Colorado and Milwaukee all in one day campaigning for him. And I see him leaving and he's wearing a baseball cap and I see the baseball cap duck into the limo that's got the Secret Service guarding him. They're going to take him to a particular place where he can then jog. And I'm thinking, you know, his life is going to be much different than he ever imagined once he wins this office, as it always is. You, and you go on after that. It serves as an example. It, it almost sounds as though, in your view, the president is kind of trapped in amber. Once well, elected. It's a kind of luxurious prison. You're the most powerful person in the world, but you can't go get a hamburger on your own. Well, you also say that, that there's a kind of growth that you experienced in the Senate, for example, that can't happen in well, the White House, or at least I, hasn't happened. I think that when a person comes to the presidency, that person is more or less fully formed, um, and that you are, you are uh, action-oriented when you're a president. It's like you you have your life experiences, you have your life values, you have everything, and then you come to the presidency and it's as if you're a sponge and the office squeezes and there's very little chance for you to replenish. I think you can learn, uh, you're probably better in your third year than you were in your first year at being president, but in terms of bringing something of your person to the job, I think you have to have it there before you get there. Hmm. Um, and I believe that uh, that's, that's the, the case. Is that what you're waiting for? No, I mean, I... I, I mean, is that, is that the moment at which you'd say, I think I'm ready to, uh, to try for that job? Well, I think that it's important to um, know the country, uh, understand the rhythms of the country. And that's a little bit like Walt Whitman. It's a Whitman-esque <laughs> quali qualification. Then I think in terms of foreign policy, since you're the commander-in-chief, that you really should have a feel for the for foreign policy issues. It shouldn't just be slogans attached to briefing books. And then third, I think that it's very important that you have a team, not only to win an election, but to govern. Those are two different things. And third, I think you've got to be able to communicate. You've got to be able to communicate short bits. You've got to be able to communicate in longer speeches. I think those are the criteria that you have to have. And when someone 
feels it's the right time for them personally, presuming those criteria, that's when I think uh, they, they should run. In 1992, I decided it wasn't the right time for me. And in retrospect, <clears throat> I was lucky I decided that because in the spring of 1992, my wife uh, developed breast cancer and had a mastectomy and chemotherapy. It's a, and a rough year. A lot of things It's a rough happened. year. My, my mother was dying of emphysema. My father went blind. Two acquaintances uh, died in airplane crashes and a friend committed suicide. I mean, that was the year. It happens to people at different times in their lives but, and, and in different ways. But that was the year and those were the moments that made me realize that catastrophe can overcome even the best laid plans. And so all I know is that I have to live year to year in the fullest way that I know how, giving the best service that I can give, thinking about in, in the deepest way possible which direction the country is headed and what is the essence of this country. And basically time present, time past is a kind of, is a, is a seismograph of all of these things. I mean, it's about the Senate, as you say. It's about what it is to be a senator. You see, you feel, you hear. It's about different people. It's about extraordinary individuals that I've met along the road. I mean, you know, the central metaphor of this book is about a woman who, or the central story of the book, is about a woman who ran for governor of Montana in 1992, Dorothy Bradley. She knew she was going to win, but she lost. And when she lost, she didn't know how to cope, so she took a job teaching in a one-room schoolhouse in northern, Minnesota, in northern Montana just to get her life together. And I saw her coming out of that experience and I said, Dorothy, how are you? Thinking about what are you going to do? And she said, well, let me tell you how, how I am by telling you about my lieutenant governor running mate. Every time he was in the state, he'd always try to get back to Billings so he could be with his family. And one night, they was, he spoke at a small town up in northern Montana. He left in a small plane. They got about 15 or 20 minutes up and all the lights in the plane went out. The instrument panel, everything was gone. He realized shortly thereafter that they were lost over this vast Montana wilderness. And then the moon came out and the moonlight hit the Yellowstone River and they realized that if they followed the Yellowstone River in the moonlight, that they would eventually get to Billings. And so that's what they did. They got to Billings and she said, you know, that's a little bit the way I am in my life, except I can see the Yellowstone River in the moonlight, but I don't know if I'm going to get to Billings. Mm -hmm. And when she said that, I thought, that's a little bit the way all of us are in our lives. That's the way the country is right now. We kind of can see the Yellowstone River in the moonlight, but we don't know if we're going to get to Billings. One of the things I, I read that, uh, that you said was that if, if the media was the way it is today, in 1978, you probably would not have run for the U.S. Senate. Right, that's What's true. changed with that? Since I think it's become much more invasive. I think that the media focuses on the personal picadellos of, uh, of the candidates. Uh, they focus on the most invasive kind of personal information. I mean, you know, somebody's running for elective office today, they've got to make some calculations. What, what, what's going to happen? Well, if you ever dare too late your property taxes, uh, the press will find out about it at the county clerk's office. I mean, you know, you, you ever work for a corporation? Well, they'll get all the records at the state secretary, secretary of state's office or the SEC. I mean, you ever have a misdemeanor? They'll find out about it. Do you ever, you know, put any of your uh, tax returns or brokerage accounts on the public record in any kind of litigation? They'll find out about it. And if they don't find out about it, your opponent will because your opponent will hire a deep research firm, which is another word for a detective agency in many cases, and they don't always use legal means. They'll get access to your bank records, to your telephone records. They'll even known to go through your garbage. And, you know, I, I recognize this, and I since then, you know, gee, I'm living at a time where in politics what I value most, which is character, is endangered. And, and, and what I am most uh, admiring of, which is humanity, is devalued. And what I'm most sensitive about, privacy, is denied. And I'm saying, you know, we're better than this. Here we have a middle class that is taking body blows that we haven't seen for a generation, endangering the finest accomplishment of this country in the last hundred years. Here we have a crying need for racial healing. Here we have a, a legitimate issue of too much money in politics. And we have our campaigns 
that end up being attack ads going at each other and our media that focuses, focuses on personal peccadillos of the candidates as opposed to what they would do to change the circumstance of people in this country today. And as a result, people disconnect. They disconnect because all of the, all of the coverage is in some, not all, but much of the coverage is, is trivializing the whole process of democratically selecting our leaders whom will help us provide for our families. You mentioned an, an, an issue, racial healing, and, and you were in the Senate gallery, I think it was, or the Senate hmm. chambers, almost 30 years ago when the Civil Rights Act passed. And said that this yeah, is the first a moment that I thought I, you know, maybe someday I'll be a U.S. Senator, the 64 Civil Rights Act, desegregated hotels, restaurants, something happened, made America a better place. That night I thought, hmm, maybe someday I can be here and help make America a better place. You gave a speech on the Senate floor <clears throat> when George Bush in 1991 voted against another civil rights bill calling it, or said he would, called it a, a quota bill. You asked him a series of questions in that speech, which as I read them are questions any of us could ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the questions? Well, sure. I mean, you know, tell us when you, uh, tell us your, essentially your racial pedigree. I mean, when did you first recognize the difference among races? Well, how did that happen? What did you do about it? Uh, wh what was the circumstance? Uh, how has your life changed? I mean, basically, it's attempting to ask as a minimum requirement of anybody who would uh, govern this country to let us know how they came to believe what they believe about race in America today. Because it has never been more important. It is polarizing to an absolutely surprising degree. And it is self-destructive for all of us. I mean, you know, if you're your brother's uh, keeper, you gotta walk your talk. If you're gonna lead the world by the power of your uh, pluralistic example, well, you can't have things like Los Angeles across television screens from Tokyo to London. And then, you know, if you, if you really wanna have a high standard of living, well, only 57% of the people entering the workforce in the United States in the year 2000 are going to be native-born white Americans. But that means that the economic future of the children of white Americans will depend increasingly on the talents of non-white Americans. That's not ideology, it's demographics. The questions that you asked George Bush are not the kinds of questions one hears asked during a campaign for all of the media that you just talked about and all of its uh -huh. research and, and, and whatnot. It also struck me that politics is a, a peculiar job in a way because it's, the, it's, a, it's a job that you apply for in a sense without ever really having to lay out your credentials directly to the voter. I've never seen a, a mm. resume, for example, of anybody who would be president. And it, and it just seems increasingly odd to me that the sorts of requirements that we have to get a job in any other kind of uh, walk of life is not required in political office. And there are intermediaries who sort of work between us, uh, telling us who you are. Right. I think one of the reasons that is so, I mean, that's good and bad, but one of the reasons that's so is because elective office is one of the most personal decisions anybody makes. They go into a private booth and they decide who are the two people they want to represent them in the U.S. Senate, who's their congressperson, who do they want to have governor, who do they want to have as president, who do they want to have as mayor, various other things. These are very personal decisions, therefore you make them I believe you should make them on the basis of uh, information, values, and knowledge. I mean, uh, I mean, another when you know, if, I, I don't think I think most politicians, to most people, are simply disembodied views. They're this position, that position, this position, that position. As you say, no context. I mean, one of the reasons that I wrote this book, with the exception of the president, who's got the camera right there all the time, and therefore we get an idea of who the president is. But no other politician is, comes close to being known in the context of their own humanity. And one of the reasons that I wrote this book was that I wanted people not only to know what a view I held about the land, the environment, the West, uh, water in the West, mining, whatever, but I wanted them to know how I came to hold that view about race or the economy or whatever. And I wanted to root that 
in the, con in the context of my own life experience, growing up in that small town on the banks of the Mississippi with that metaphorical river, as well as the real river, running through my life as coursing through it like the, the powerful old man river that it is. And so much that when somebody finishes this book, that they'll actually be able to say, hmm, well, I think I know Bradley. Mm. So you wouldn't disagree with one book reviewer who said, in some ways, it felt like the platform for a presidential no. run. Well, no. I mean, you know, you get these reviewers that say, it's a platform because he talks about so much policy, which is very little part of the book. And then you get other people who say, well, he should have talked about more policy. So you're never going to win with these people. <laughs> I think, you know, when I, if I walked out of this studio today, and walked across the, uh, the street here in this busy University of Washington campus and was hit by a truck and, and that was it. Bradley was nothing but a, a wet spot in the road. I will have had my say. And that's why I wrote this book. But that's not enough. Well, I don't expect to get hit. <laughs> I wanted to, there is a, a kind of, I don't want to use the word fatalism. You just mentioned <clears throat> this thing about getting hit by a truck. But um, a belief that once, and it's a belief based on your experience, once elevated, once celebrated in the public eye, it is inevitable <clears throat> that you will be torn down. And the New Yorker said some years ago in a profile of you, you have an ambivalence about public life that borders on perversity. Mm. Well, uh, you've described the iron law of celebrity, according to me. I mean, and that is that the faster you go up, the faster the inexorable forces are put into play that will pull you down. And the question is how to be steady and do well over a long period of time. And I think there's a significant difference between celebrity, which simply means your face is on magazines or on TV. I mean, the weather person can be a celebrity, right? Uh, and heroism, which I think really only exists in history books. I mean, I don't think there are heroes. And leadership, which is absolutely essential. I mean, I don't think, I think leadership is not something that is done to people, like fixing their teeth, right? <laughs> I mean, leadership is what unlocks our potential, our individual potentials. At the same time, it calls us to task for the lies that we've told ourselves, whether it's about race or the deficit or whatever. And at the right moment with the right person, it alters our national self-perception. I mean, I think that's happened from time to time. For example, I, I recall... Uh, the moments people remember. People remember. Uh, leaders that people remember. Mm. FDR, midst of the Depression. You live in Philadelphia, row houses. It's a hot summer night. He's speaking on the radio. You walk down the street. You got stereo before stereo. Everybody's every listening. Every family's listening. Mm. And they're listening because they believe that he's going to say something that will give them hope. I mean, that's what leadership can do. Mm. I mean, here was a man, you know, flat on his back, almost literally, the country flat on its back. He was cheery. He was saying we can do it because he believed he could do it. There he was doing it for all of us could do it. Mm. And that doesn't happen very often. Mm. And it's not that you haven't thought about it. Maybe, it. maybe it'll happen with you. Who knows? Bill Bradley, Senator Bill Bradley, I want to thank you for being a guest on Palmer. Thank you, Marsh. Really Best enjoy wishes. it. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.